As I said, we are going to be doing powers of functions today, and we're going to be looking at some graphs. We're going to start by looking at some graphs that you're familiar with, and very quickly we're going to go into unfamiliar ground, <laughs> as has been the theme. Okay? So powers of functions. When you see the word powers, we're thinking about taking a function, right? y equals f of x, and then raising the whole f of x piece to some kind of power. Strictly speaking. So the classical ones that we're going to look at, the most important ones, the most important powers are a half and two. Those are the most common ones. You will see them all the time when you take the square root of function, when you square a function. There are some quite predictable features that are important for us when we have a look at this. Okay. So that's the first thing. However, there is a slight variant on this, which also comes up somewhat frequently, which is this. Right? Now, do you remember when we were doing reflections and flipping and, and translations and that kind of thing? We'd say, oh yeah, y equals like say the absolute value of f of x, right? And then we, we know what happens to a line like that. It's like, okay, it turns into that bouncy thing. Well, this is the same kind of thing when you flip over to the other side. What effect does that have? Okay, so we're going to explore that a little bit. Now, to begin with, before we look at all these unfamiliar functions, we've got to look at the functions we're most familiar with. So what we're going to do is we're going to start by considering... The simplest function that does something even vaguely interesting when you take the square root, when you square it, which is simply y equals x. Okay? Now, therefore, when you raise it to the powers that I'm interested in, that's obviously going to give you y equals the square root of x, and then it's also going to give you the parabola. Now, you know exactly what all of these look like, but there are some very important lessons to draw on from these. So we're going to draw these three graphs, um, these two together, and these two together on the same set of axes. Okay, so just take a couple of minutes, draw these up. They don't have to be um, big or beautiful because they're quite simple graphs, as you know. <laughs> All right, so we've got um, two sets of axes. What I like on each set of axes is the y equals x line. And then in addition to that, over here we'll do root x. Over here, we'll do x squared. So we'll superimpose that on top, and then we'll notice some things. OK, all right, so why don't we have a look at these? Now, like I said, we're going to look at these because we're very familiar with them. But I want to draw your attention to some things that we don't tend to have to worry about because we're so familiar with them. We don't think about root x in relation to x. Because we know exactly what root x looks like. And we don't think about x squared in relation to x very much because we know what x squared looks like. Okay? So we're going to notice lots and lots of little features about this. Um, we're going to look and look and look and see what we notice. Okay, so first thing, let's begin with root x. I immediately notice that y equals x has no domain restriction, but y equals root x does have a domain restriction. And that is because? Okay, now. I heard a few different phrases, but I'm going to put, because I, I sort of heard, um, the, the answers I heard coming back from the room are the same kinds of answers that a year three kid will say when I say, why can't you do three take away five? And they'll say, well, because you can't, you know? You guys are extension two students. You know about square roots and things underneath square roots. You have better, more specific, accurate language to explain why on this graph, let me give you a clue. This graph, I can't have um, all values. Why not? Because there's no imaginary. Okay, I have no, I have no imaginary units on this. That's a real set of real numbers. That's a set of real numbers. Now you guys know that the square roots of negative numbers do exist. They're just not on this graph, right? They're on the argan plane, and I don't have the argan plane here. If I did have it, I guess it would come out, like this would be the real part, and I guess because this axis has been occupied by another real number, I guess the uh, imaginary part would come out this way, okay? So if you want to imagine the, um, uh, the imaginary axis, no, I don't have it, um, sort of extending out this way from the board, okay? So what you're used to looking at, I can't draw on here because I don't have any axis for that. Rather, over here where I do have just real numbers, I've got nothing. Okay, so, so that's that, that's fine. What else do you want to tell me about this root x, particularly in relation to y equals x? Any things you want to tell me about it? Uh, 
Okay, so there's a, there's a point of intersection, right? There it is. In fact, it's so important we should say what it is. It's 1-1. One, one. Okay. Now, why is that the intersection? Why is that the intersection? Because, because the square root of 1 is itself 1. Now, that's not the only point of intersection, is it? What's the other one? 0, 0. zero, zero. And uh, that's also important, so we should put that in as well. Because there are only two numbers in existence whose square roots are themselves, and they are 0 and 1. Okay, so that's good. That's the first important thing to note. What else can you tell me about this graph? What else do you observe? Hmm. Yeah, Eric. It's on the positive side. Okay, so wait, when you say the positive side, do you mean like th this way or, or this way? The Which way are we talking? The, the ones in the first quadrant. Over here, yeah, okay. So that's two things. For, for, one, for one, we've got the first thing before, which is the domain restriction. In the here, if you're only playing in the real number field, then you can't take square roots of negative values of x, okay? But that doesn't explain why I'm up here. Why have I only got positive values of y? Anyone want to give me a suggestion? There's an important word here that starts with the letter P. I don't know if you remember it. What's it doing this? It's the principal square root. Very good, right? There are two square roots. For, for real numbers, but I'm only drawing the principal square root. I could draw this other side down here, but that would give me a relation, not a function, so we leave it off, okay? All right, anything else you want to notice? Yeah. Uh, when, it's less, when x is less than one, and uh, x, the square root of x is greater than y plus x, and when x is greater than one, then it's less than one. Like yeah, very good. Okay, and this is a really crucial point. In fact, maybe in terms of graphing all these other guys that we're going to shortly, maybe the most important point, there's this up-down change. There's a vertical change. The abscissa changes, right? No, the ordinate changes. Now, how does it change? Well, it's actually easier to think on the right-hand side first. When x is bigger than 1, the square root of any number is going to be smaller than that number. Square root of 64 is 8. Square root of 49 is 7. You're always getting a smaller number. So long as you're on this side, all right? Because like when you multiply by something, you're going to get bigger. Okay? But when you go in between here, from 0 to 1, the square root of a number is bigger than the number. Yeah? Like, for example, the square root of a quarter. The number that when you multiply it by itself gives you a quarter is, of course, a half. Right? And a half is bigger than a quarter. Okay? Now, this is very important. When you, are, um, when you were, were drawing graphs like this, right? Right? One of the things we noticed was that wherever y equals 0 is a really critical point. Because when you flip it vertically, all those zeros, they stay the same. Yeah? So for example, something that looks like this would become something that looks like this. Right? So zeros are important. Okay? But whenever you're dealing with these guys, y equals 0 is not only the important line, y equals 1 is also an important line. Anytime you intersect with that, you know you're behaving above or below that line. Okay? So it's really, really important. Okay, one more thing to notice for me. Um, you've got this up and down business that we've just noticed. What about what's happening here? What, what is going on here? What's the gradient at this point? Does anyone know what the gradient is at that point, at the origin? Hmm. Hmm. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not. Now, now, y equals the square root of x um, doesn't have a gradient at the origin, and you can verify that in a variety of ways. Um, for example, you could just differentiate the dark thing, right? Well, what, what is the derivative of um, x? You're going to bring the power out the front, which is a half, and then you're going to reduce the power by one. The power was a half before, and now it's negative a half. So actually, that means it's going to be down here. Okay. So you go ahead and you try to slot in x equals 0 to find out what's happening at the origin. And of course, you get a, a nonsensical result. Okay. There's no gradient here. Because if you think about rise over run, how far is it running? How far is it running? The answer is it's not running anywhere. It's, if you were to draw a tangent here, it would be... Actually, I've already drawn a tangent there. Do you notice that? It's the y-axis. Okay. So there's no gradient there. Now that's really weird. It's really weird. And that's important because anytime you get something like this, you're going to get your gradient becoming, well, undefined. Okay? Right, keep that in mind. Okay. 